Apologies in advance if I speak too fast, and if and when I do, please do this or something which indicates that I should speak slower. Uh, quite a challenge with only 15 minutes. So um, I'm guessing that many of us in here have uh, heard about surveillance, have read about surveillance, uh, are probably even likely bored of listening about surveillance, especially since uh, the media have been reporting on various incidents uh, quite extensively over the last years uh, since the Snowden revelations started. Um, but still, even though I think based on the revelations, based on the work of various NGOs, even though we have a lot of proof and a lot of data which shows what the surveillance landscape looks like, there are still many you know, who argue that they have nothing to hide. Uh, governments are still using the whole national security rhetoric that surveillance is carried out only for the purpose of crime and terrorism. Um, well, in, in this talk, I'm briefly going to talk about why it's not only about national security. And in regards to the whole, uh, I have nothing to hide, I'm not a terrorist or a criminal argument. The way I see it, I mean, on the one hand, if we're arguing that, then that is clearly, in my opinion, a psychological coping mechanism. Or it means that, you know, we likely don't understand how surveillance is carried out, which itself is fine. I mean, it is quite complicated and very invisible in so many ways or we just simply don't care about it. But regardless of what our reasoning is, in the end, the way I see it at least, um, based on the research I've been doing over the last years, it really seems to be a largely political issue. In my opinion, probably one of the most important political issues globally nowadays, because it underlines, uh, it has to do with power, which is exercised in subtle ways over the lives of all of us, regardless of where we live. I should grab this. So first of all, uh, it's important to understand like, what do we mean about surveillance? How is it carried out, technically, practically speaking? Um, in the past, a, a lot to be able to answer answering this question has been pretty difficult because a lot of it has been carried out in secret. However, there is this very interesting event which some of you might be aware of. It's the ISS World Trade Show, which has been dubbed the Wiretappers Bowl, which is kind of self-explanatory. And at this event, what you have essentially is a, a booming surveillance technology industry which showcase and exhibit and sell their various types of products, their various types of internet monitoring solutions and spyware and so on to law enforcement agencies around the world. In this map, you can see where these trade shows take place every year. And the interesting thing about these trade shows is that some activists have gone there and they have uh, collected brochures from these companies and then published them online, which shows that, and by going through these brochures, we are able to see practically uh, what kind of equipment are governments using, what are they in a position to collect, intercept, and so on. So when going, so these brochures, you can find them in the spy files, which are published on WikiLeaks website. And while going through them, um, again, here for, while preparing for this presentation, I happened to come across Ultron, which is a Ukrainian company. Um, I'm not showing this here because I have anything against or personal with Ultron. This is just to clarify. Uh, I'm just bringing this as an example because it's a Ukrainian company that I came across in the, in the documents. Um, so if you're wondering uh, practically how is surveillance carried out in Ukraine, personally I haven't done research in the country so I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. But if you look at the types of um, technologies that are sold by companies in this country, probably to law enforcement agencies also in this country, then you can get, one, you can get a simple idea. So this is from uh, Ultron's brochure, and well, one of their brochures. And what you can see essentially is that they have, various, they have certain solutions for intercepting various different types of protocols, one of which, so they intercept emails, and when they do interception, what they collect is both metadata and content data. By metadata, we mean information about information. So for example, uh, if you are sending an email, the metadata is your email address, the time you sent it, and who you sent it. Uh, whereas the content data is the actual, you know, email that you, that you sent. They also intercept uh, voice calls, uh, again, metadata and content data, so who you called, when, and so on, and what you said in terms of the content, or they try to intercept this type of data. Uh, oops. They also intercept, um, amongst the various types of things that they intercept, they also intercept, um, you know, uh, instant, uh, uh, metadata and content data from uh, instant messaging services, chat services, and also um, 
uh, various types of data which flows in HTTP. HTTP is the protocol for transmitting data across the internet. If it's, if it's HTTPS, it's encrypted. Uh, the interesting thing here is that they mention uh, Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, etc. cetera. I, um, let's, I just wanna mention here that this brochure is from 2011, back then, um, Google and some of these companies made the huge mistake of transmitting data across their data centers in plain HTTP, which meant that the data was trans that their users' data was transmitted in, in clear text, and thus any government or any other third party could potentially intercept it. Now they are transmitting it encrypted, but. Uh, there still is a lot of other traffic on the internet, which has been transmitted in clear text because let's not forget that, you know, a lot of websites and services are still in HTTP. Um, so before with what I mentioned, that, that these are some of the mainstream solutions that you will find a lot of these companies selling at these events to law enforcement agencies. You might have heard of uh, FinFisher. I don't know. Uh, if you've heard or read about FinFisher, please raise your hand. Okay, cool. So... Quite some people, yeah, great. Uh, so yeah, so for those who aren't familiar with it, FinFisher was uh, notoriously covered because it's one of the most sophisticated types of spyware that we've seen. Um, essentially, it's able to remotely take control of a target's computer and collect all the data in there, and then when collecting it, doing so in a cryptid way and, and in a subtle way where the user is not able to know that their computer has basically been owned. Uh, this is... Um, was, uh, this is uh, from the Citizen Lab, which published a report uh, about FinFisher, and uh, in the map here you can see where they found command and control servers where this has been used. But the interesting thing, the reason why I'm, point, I'm bringing FinFisher as a specific example here is because, as I mentioned before, very, even to this day, governments insist that surveillance is carried out for national security purposes. But based on the research, for example, from the Citizen Lab, what you can see is that in many cases, the, the very type of equipment, like FinFisher, which can be bought by these types of uh, trade shows, is actually used for targeting human rights activists and journalists. And in my opinion, this is extremely concerning because we need human rights activists you know, to challenge the status quo, to, to report on abuse and so on. And we, need, and we need journalists to be able to collect data and report on it in, in a way which is confidential without that data being you know, um, used against them or collected in secret by, uh, by adversaries. So what you can see here is an example of some Bahraini activists uh, targeted with Finn Fisher uh, by their governments. It's worth noting here that these activists don't actually, when they were targeted with FinFisher, they didn't actually live in Bahrain, they lived in the UK, yet their government remotely took control of their computers uh, by targeting them with, with uh, FinFisher spyware. How this happened, well, so here what you can see is an email that was sent to them. By looking at this email, it looks like a very normal, you know, banal email, well, not, not banal, but like a legit email. It's sent by some uh, Melissa Chan from Al Jazeera. Um, and anyone who sees this, you know, would be like, okay, fine. And what this email includes is attachments, like the ones below. Um, and essentially the email's asking them to, you know, open the attachments to see uh, pictures of torture, which they could potentially use as part of their activism. Can anyone spot what is wrong with this email? Exactly, the XC, exactly. So while this looks like a normal JPEG file, actually if you look at the beginning, what you can see is EXC, which means it's actually an executable file. So by, by downloading, by opening this image, their computer is ultimate, was ultimately infected with spyware. But it's not only Bahraini activists. We've seen many activists and journalists around the world who have been targeted with this type of spyware and with various other types of spyware by their governments as well. We've seen this in Ethiopia, where, it, where many Ethiopian journalists have been targeted by their government. We've seen this in Syria, where um, many, many political dissidents have also been targeted. Uh, and in these cases, this is very concerning, because while we might say, ah, oh, this is computer stuff, I don't know this, I don't care about this, and so on. In reality, what that means, that if you are, for example, a Syrian opposition activist and your computer is owned, that data probably can and will be used to put you into jail, best case scenario. So this does have a lot of real world effects. So and that, apart from targeting the people who are supposed to defend our rights, in many cases we see that surveillance is carried out for the purposes of reinforcing geopolitical dynamics of power. We can see this, for example, here. So this is um, a memorandum. So this is basically a letter which uh, was published from the Snowden leaks. And what you can see here is the intelligence relationship between the NSA and Jordan. How is this relevant to anything? 
again, we learned that basically the NSA provided intelligence data to, um, to Israel in its operations against Palestinians. And the way that it got the data about the Palestinians was through Jordan. So while we may trust our own government, while we may trust uh, our data being in a certain place, we don't really have any guarantee that that data won't end up, you know, in the hands of a government that we don't trust. Also, let's not forget that alliances keep changing. While we might now, for whatever reason, trust the US, maybe, for whatever political reasons, we will have a better reason not to trust the US in a few years. But by that point, you know, we, a, lot of, a lot of our data might already be in their hands, or they might have other ways, more covert ways of getting access to our data through, through memorandum of understanding, which is basically an intelligence agreement for sharing data with other countries uh, and so on, who, who have access to ours and so on. This is also from the Snowden revelations. Uh, this refers to, um, the fiber optic, uh, to, to the tapping of fiber optic cables. Uh, there are various programs like Tempora, carried out by the GCHQ. And what we have seen is that in many cases, intelligence agencies around the world have collaborated with each other by either directly sharing uh, their citizens' data with other agencies or by providing direct access to the fiber optic cables that make up the backbone of their, of their internet. So again, political alliances might change across time, but if uh, a specific government or a specific intelligence agency has access to your internet's infrastructure, regardless of what their political relationship is, they will probably still have that access, and that will, very dif that will, it will be very difficult to, cha to change that or to ensure that they don't have access to it anymore. Um, and this is also, the reason why this is all very political, the reason why I think that surveillance has a very, very political nature, and we haven't been highlighting this or stressing upon this enough, is because what we have seen again from the Snowden revelations, for example, is that unlike the rhetoric that surveillance is carried out for the purpose of national security, uh, well, it depends on how you define national security, of course, but what we have seen in many cases is that in reality that is to provide some sort of advantage to specific governments in global affairs and negotiations. So this slide, for example, shows how, they, how the NSA collaborated with a certain company, AT&T, um, in order to be able to get access to the talking points of the UN Secretary General prior to discussions. Similarly, this pertains to the interception of communications of uh, the government representatives of various countries attending the, the UN Security Council, um, so that the US could know everyone else's positions prior to discussions in regards to sanctions um, in Iran. This is, this is extremely concerning, and while this has been covered by the media, or it was covered by the media at the time, we somehow have forgotten about it. We still somehow tend to think about surveillance as something which doesn't interest us, which doesn't concern us. But wh what we actually do see is that the decisions made on the political level, on the national level, on the international level, the, the specific dynamics of power which are reinforced in specific areas around the world, a lot of those are enabled through surveillance. Surveillance in the end, is largely, I would argue, is a tool uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a tool for reinforcing specific dynamics of power. Power by us, by the people? Not really. Power by those who have the most money, who can, who can afford to basically, you know, buy the resources and so on to be able to have access to this type of equipment. This is uh, Surveillance Without Borders, a project that um, I've been working on in my free time. Um, and this is based on the documents leaked by Snowden. They're all categorized under those six categories. Um, the first category, which is leaders, is basically all the documents which are specific to political leaders around the world being targeted by, by surveillance. And as you can see in the map, all the green countries are the countries which are mentioned in the documents that their political leaders have been targeted. By targeting, what I mean is basically that, for example, when, they were, uh, when their government representative was at the UN, then their communications were intercepted, or that their emails directly got hacked, various different types of examples. And you can find all these examples in the data in the project specifically. But while we might argue that Okay, um, sure, there are a lot of political interests, but hey, this is nothing new. Um, surveillance has been going on for a very long time. We knew it was a thing also in the Cold War. We know that's cut off for political interests and so on. What does this have to do with me? Well, the difference, well, sh sure, I will agree that a lot of these things have been in reality for a very long time, and it's certainly not, nothing very new. The difference right now is that we, as the public, are reinforcing uh, this type of the world that we're walking into, we're, we are reinforcing all of this. 
We do it every day through the various types of services that we use, like Facebook, Google, and so on. I'm not suggesting that we don't use those services because that would also be very unrealistic. But what I am saying is that from our daily internet activity, from the way we live on the internet, we are feeding the system with our data all the time, whether we like it or not. And arguably, we don't even have choices to do otherwise. But in the end of the day, what we are doing is that by default, we are building a gold mine of data about us, which intelligence agencies or other third parties can potentially just tap into at will in any given moment of time. And this is uniquely valuable because if you, if you were in power and you wanted to shift society, if you wanted to um, you know, pursue your own interests, if you want to identify all of those groups or individuals who are a threat to your interests in any way, what better way to do it than in a system where everyone creates profiles for themselves, so to speak, based on their online activity. And by profiles, on the one hand, there are the profiles that we, so to speak, create about ourselves through the data that, that we give. But I'm not, just, I'm not referring to like, profiles that are created on Facebook. I'm actually really referring to profiles that are created about us by third parties without our knowledge and without our consent. And unfortunately, this is the democracy that we actually live in. We live in a democracy where there are multiple third parties making decisions, uh, taking decisions about our lives without our knowledge, without our consent, based on profiles about that they, that they think are accurate or which they want to believe are accurate. Practically how this works, so these two slides, by the way, are from the GCHQ. TDI stands for Target Attention Identifier. So they themselves recognize that these are the sources where they can identify targets or potentially even create, so to speak, targets. And the way this works is you know, through correlating individuals through various um, social media, by um, basically putting all the dots together, analyzing data, and so on. So while we might think that we have nothing to hide, unfortunately, it doesn't have anything to do, well, it's not only about you, it's not only about me, it's about all of us. Because you might not have anything to hide, but at the end of the day, you are not alone in this universe. You are, whether you like it or not, connected to many other individuals. The more insecure your data is, the more insecure uh, the, the data or, you know, and by default the lives of those connected to you might be as a result of that. It's not about you, it's not about me, it's about all of us. Surveillance is very political. When we vote, like we just think of it in this simple way, we choose to vote. But when we vote, we don't vote because we necessarily believe that the, that the specific political party that will be in power will necessarily have direct impact on every single thing we do on a daily basis, right? We vote because we, want, because we care about who is in power. And we care about who is in power because they're the ones who shape and influence our lives. Very similarly, questioning surveillance means questioning those who have power over our lives and how they are shaping our lives based on the data about us. Because our data reflects our lives and those who control our data control our lives. And this is something that I think is definitely worth remembering. Thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, these are some resources. Um, so Surveillance Lab Borders, the first one, is the project that I mentioned earlier with the map. Uh, under Surveillance Lab publications, you can find specific reports about malware attacks against various uh, human rights activists and uh, journalists. Digital Freedom uh, is a new experimental project where we're basically collecting data, um, where we're aggregating in a global map all the targeted malware attacks against human rights activists. Uh, we're aggreg aggregating data about all the surveillance vendors and all the surveillance resellers. Um, encryption laws and so on. Secure in a Box is a resource for digital security if you want to learn how to protect your communications and those, those around you. My Shadow very similarly provides various resources about how to think about, the, about your data and, and so on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, combining your presentation uh, with the picture of, I'm not sure if you've seen it, okay of Mark Zuckerberg posted yesterday. Uh, and in this picture, he, his laptop, his, his camera, and his microphone are covered with the tape. So are the tools, for example, which are supposed to help us, such as you know, VPNs, Tor, are they actually working compared to the software which you are showing used by governments? Or is it only the, the whole paranoia for us, okay. you know, the second option? 
Yeah, that's a great question um, because it triggered two things. The first thing is that I'm glad you mentioned the Mark Zuckerberg example. Um, actually, the, the one organization that I work with, Tactical Tech, we recently had a two-month exhibition, and one of the artifacts in the exhibition was this model of uh, Mark Zuckerberg's house. But it had next to it the four houses that he bought surrounding his so he could protect his privacy. So it's very interesting to see that um, leaders of companies which are advocating that we live in this post-privacy world are in fact actually, uh, it, it basically triggers questions of, in the end, who is privacy for? Is it, only, is it for the masses or is it only for those who can afford to buy it? In regards to your question about VPNs and Tor and so on, I mean... I don't want to generalize with VPNs. There's all sorts of different types of VPNs, um, and there's various reasons to trust certain VPNs over others. Um, but in terms of Tor, I personally definitely uh, trust and use Tor, and would definitely recommend it to everyone. Um, digital security, th there's this misconception of, uh, often that uh, digital security is this quick fix solution, but actually it's a process. So it's not like you use one tool and therefore you're fine. Um, it's, it's more about um, about adapting your life to a different type of way of thinking and behaving and using technologies as part of that. And Tor is just a small component. It's, it's not the magic bullet, for sure. But Tor actually is also included um, in one of the projects resource that I had there, Secure in a Box. And there's a hands-on guide, which explains how you can use it um, for all different types of operating systems. And we have hands-on guides there for not only Tor, but for most of the basic digital security tools. Awesome. Thank you.